Welcome. Welcome to the conversation about money and love. We're just going to get every, give everyone a beat to join us live. Is anyone else obsessed with this song? Feel free to take a breath. Move around if you want to. We're just going to give people a minute to join. Welcome, everybody. I know lots of you are joining live. Just playing a little Beyonce right now because why wouldn't we? Take a minute to take in this gorgeous song as we wait for people to join. One step to the right. <laughs> you always thought was nice. Okay, you don't have to hear me sing this whole time. Welcome to a conversation about love and money. We're going to get started in just a minute. Keep joining. No, hold them. Dance down, 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 down. All right. Feel free to light up the chat with a little Beyonce if you want to. P.S., by the way, check out Levi's stock. Okay, I think we're gonna get going. I'm kind of sad about this. We might have to have a dance party at the end. Okay, <laughs> we do the grand fade out. Welcome, thank you for joining live on a Wednesday afternoon. My name is Jackie Zayner and I write a newsletter here on LinkedIn called She Money. And we have a platform by the same name. And this is the first of a series of four LinkedIn lives we're gonna be doing in the month of April for financial capabilities financial literacy, otherwise called month. And we were calling this series Money Plus. This one, Money Plus Love. For the next three Wednesdays, we're gonna have three other sessions, Money Plus Kids, Money Plus Divorce, and Money Plus Fertility. Uh, because one of our most popular newsletters last year was the one on financing fertility. So join us for all of those right here in LinkedIn, LinkedIn Live. That said, uh, we wanted to launch the series with Money Plus Love, and it is likely that we learned about uh, money from our parents, the OG of our love relationships. It is likely that we've learned to navigate money situations, even with our friends and romantic partners, in a way that's deeply connected to what we learn from our parents. And guess what? That's we're not taught in school or really anywhere, which is one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it right here on LinkedIn with an expert during Financial Capabilities Month, because learning to navigate love and relationships is a money skill. Now, I want to put an image in your head before we get going. Take a breath and think about this. You are in a boat. That boat is just cruising around, smooth sailing. The waters are calm. Then put in the boat someone that you might have had a money situation with, a money conflict. Think about how that makes you feel. Is the water suddenly moving underneath you? Maybe a feeling of motion sickness. Maybe you look up and you feel a wave coming towards you. You know that's hitting the boat. You can see it coming and maybe it does. Navigating the choppy waters of money and love may sometimes feel like you're in that boat, literally a storm without a set of oars, a motor, a compass, a sail. And that is what the conversation today is all about. Talking about the waves, we want to give you some navigation system. And that is what this book and this co-author has really created. She uses the word framework. And if you know me, I love that word frameworks. And this is how you're going to, we're going to learn something today about how to apply it to love and relationships. I'm going to add a quote from the book before I introduce our guest, Abby Davison. Few aspects of our lives are as fundamental to health and happiness as love and money. And yet historically, they have been pitted against one another. If this is true for you, it is high time to kiss and make up and realize that love and money can really go together. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest author, Abby Davison. So Abby is, as you know, the author of a great book. She is also which is called, and we'll post everything in the chat, an love and Money and Love, an Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. She co-wrote it with her uh, co-author, Myra Strober, 
who I go way, way back with, like literally 25 years since what I was so excited to write about their book last year when it came out. She is a featured expert on this topic across so many platforms. And what is so interesting too, is that they both taught a course at Stanford Business School around this topic. So I'm excited to welcome Abby to the conversation today. Please welcome Abby Davison. Hi, Abby. Hi, welcome Jackie. to LinkedIn Live on a Wednesday afternoon. Hi, I'm so delighted to be here. Thanks for including me. Well, uh, so many things to kick off and just invite anyone who's watching live, of course, to post questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them. And also realizing that this is going to be a recorded conversation. So even if you're watching it after the original air date, we do check comments and would love your feedback on this session and questions left unanswered. So Abby, thank you so much for joining again. And let's just start off with the question of why did you write this book? And especially, why did you write this book? Because um, obviously you felt that there was a lot unsaid in the context of this big topic around money and love. Absolutely. Well, before I co-taught the class with Myra, I was a student of Myra's. So I took her class, which was called Work and Family, actually. Um, another way of saying money and love because we get money when we work and we love people who um, are either our chosen family or our family of origin. And I took the class when I was a second year student in Stanford Business School and I took it with the guy I had been dating. We had met in business school. We had um, gotten pretty serious and we were about to graduate and we were facing big questions like, should we accept jobs in the same city? Should we move in together if we ended up in the same city? And Myra had shared a surprising piece of data in the class. She's a labor economist, as you know, yeah. so there was lots of data, always statistics. And it said that couples that live together before getting married have higher divorce rates. And that was very surprising to us. We thought like, that's counterintuitive. We certainly did not want that fate to befall us if we ended up moving in together. And so for our final paper, we dug into the data and looked at why is that the case? Can anything be done to prevent it? Um, interviewed people who had lived together successfully and unsuccessfully. And what we learned is, yes, there is something that can be done to prevent it. And it is being intentional. Mm -hmm. The problem comes when you slide into the decision to live together rather than decide and have all the conversations about how will we combine finances? How are we going to combine our career ambitions? Do we want children? And so we wrote what became the blueprint for now 15 years of marriage. We'll celebrate in the fall. We went back as guest speakers for many years. And I was working in a Fortune 200 company, observing that the, class, the, the conversations I had in the class were life-changing. And I saw many of um, the colleagues I had and the people on my team did not have access to that information. Mm -hmm. And if they did, it would be a game changer for them too. And so when Myra retired and told me she was writing a book about the class and offered me the chance to be her co-author, I jumped at it. And it has been such a joy to partner with her to get more of the wisdom that she began out into the world to help people have more transparent and meaningful conversations about the most important things in life. Thank you for that framing. I love what you said to not slide, but decide. Is that the term I think that you pulled up? And I, that's so on point to everything we're doing here at She Money and what motivated me, honestly, to even create this platform and to continue to write is this idea of intention and being mindful. Like we, I think that was true for me. You, you start relationships, you're in it, and all of a sudden things start happening. And the idea, well, certainly planning, which we're going to get to because that's a big part of your book, but just setting intention, slowing down and planning things out a little bit because when the heart, you know, and other parts, <laughs> the one, I just made that up. <laughs> when the heart and other parts start talking, the brain might, mm, you know, take a little nappy poo. <laughs> Let's just say that. And so thank you for, for just, um, for how you framed your, your origin story around this. So you created, and I, as I said in the intro, a framework. 
And I love frameworks. And we're going to get into a lot of examples and bring it to life with stories. And if people want to post questions in the chat or scenarios, we'll bring them in. But as a lover of frameworks, that's this. And I don't think I hold, held up the book before, so I'm going to because it's a beautiful book with a beautiful cover. But how did you develop this framework? And just sort of give us the, the, the quick download on the different C's when it comes to money and love. Yeah, well, I love a good framework too. I'm a recovering consultant. That was my first job out of college, a management consultant. So I, I also love a good framework. And the reason we developed a framework, which was, by the way, not part of the course when I took it, we developed it together through our research for the book and, and applied it to our own lives and to the lives of lots of uh, readers in the early days So uh, while we were drafting the book, um, was because you're exactly right that when we are um, in an emotional state, we make decisions very quickly and we go with our gut or our heart or whatever other part you want to talk about. <laughs> uh, and, and it's actually um, physiologically impossible for us to access the rational thinking part of our brain when we are in that emotional state. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons we um, include, we, we developed a framework was to encourage people to slow down because that is the only way that you can be deliberate and intentional and um, access that thinking part of our brain, the analytical part of our brain. But we also don't want to um, have people get stuck in analysis paralysis because that's a, the other issue, right? Where, where these decisions are either made too quickly or they're analyzed to death. And, and therefore that's a decision in and of itself, right? If you're just sort of constantly ruminating and spreadsheet tabs are proliferating. So, the, the five steps of the framework are encouraged, uh, are um, are there so that it um, can be applied to any situation because all money and love questions are different. Everyone's situation is different. So we certainly aren't presuming to give people specific advice, but we wanted to give them a way to think about it and a process to follow that was comprehensive, but actually flexible so that they could apply it and that they wouldn't get stuck in analysis paralysis. So we called our framework the five C's because who doesn't love alliteration? Love it. Um, uh, so the first, and I'll touch on them briefly. I know we'll go through some examples, so I won't get into a ton of detail here, but the first C is to clarify what's most important to you. And this one is, it sounds so simple, but Jackie, we know it's so hard to um, quiet the voices that we hear, um, our parents' voices telling us what we should be doing our mentors, maybe society. Um, so this is really about what you want, not what your friends want or your neighbors want or your grandmother before she passed away wanted for you. Um, the second C is to communicate with those most affected by the decision. Um, and that often means before you feel ready. So we can, we can talk about why it's so scary to talk about money and, and mm -hmm. why but why it's actually super important to wade into those um, those choppy waters because uh, that's the only way that you can can have meaningful conversations. The third C is to consider a broad range of choices. The fourth is to check in with trusted resources, and the fifth C is to explore likely consequences across different time horizons. And there's all sorts of human biases that we can get into that come into play and why we're trying to be aware of those biases and use this framework to help our brains compensate for what is either a human bias that everyone has or a decision-making tendency that we might have that we need to adjust for as we move through these decisions. That is so powerful. And in some ways it sounds clinical, right? I feel like this could be applied to almost this framework, almost to anything in life. The idea of slowing down, thinking about what you want, right? what are your needs in the situation, recognizing how you may be activated, communicate, et cetera. So just say, love it. And I just want to invite folks that are listening to take a beat with this, because as you said, and I, I think I mentioned to you, this to you, Abby, but I, I'm in the middle of my second time through a course called The Trauma of Money. And we spoke about how just like emotions, those emotions can actually be pretty extreme and show up in, in trauma. And as you said, when you're triggered or activated, you do not make good decisions, period, full out. And what I'm learning in that course is how prevalent financial trauma is 
both his personal experiences and identity based on that. And it is this course is sort of, you know, that deeper unpacking of all those things that could make it so challenging to even show up in a way that isn't triggering before you even enter a specific scenario, let alone, um, you know, a specific uh, with a specific person. So I just want, I just want to put an exclamation mark behind what you're saying. And it's not being clinical, you know, to, to put a framework around kind of this money and money and love. And I just want to make sure we're all talking. We're not just talking obviously about romantic relationships. You're very intentional in saying all type of love and money relationships, family, friends, romantic partners. Um, so just to make sure everyone sort of knows that that is the expansive context that we're talking about this framework. So there's a lot of conventional wisdom in this area around money and love. I could give you my list. But talk about sort of some of it that is just plain, in your opinion, wrong when it comes to um, this intersection of uh, money plus love. Well, you're exactly right. There is so much conventional wisdom, both that we absorb unconsciously from movies and, you know, social media, and also that we ta were taught and observed by, by watching, you know, maybe how our parents did things. The biggest myth is that you should separate financial decisions, money decisions, and use your head to analyze those. And you should make romantic decisions with your heart because those are more pure when you don't include money. And, and that's really materialistic to think about money when you think about a prospective partner. But that is terrible advice because as we know, uh, decisions about relationships certainly affect your bank account, decisions about um, where to live and what career to pursue certainly affect your relationships. And so the, the way to make better, more holistic decisions is to think about these two and to talk about these two things together. So we should absolutely ignore the conventional wisdom to separate the two. We should certainly merge them. Um, and it can feel really uncomfortable. And we we could I can tell you, you know, some personal stories about how I um, felt when I first put this into practice. But it is I have just observed the power of having money conversations with loved ones. Um, certainly my then boyfriend, now husband, uh, we got a crash course during my risk course, literally in having these conversations. And it is like night and day compared to previous relationships I had where I was much more reluctant to talk about money for all of those conventional wisdom reasons. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that is the big one, the idea that they're separate and just the big one that we don't talk about money in polite conversations. And especially for women, we're women on this phone call, predominantly she money is targeted towards women plus because there are so many social norms around money that are gendered, right? That are, uh, especially uh, men, it's, it's much more uh, success. Let's just talk about that one. Men, I would say, and again, these are big generalizations, men, their identity, maybe how the scene, we think about men, more money, more power, good thing. Women, not so much. Women, it's more around beauty maybe is what gives your, your power, youthful energy. And we're gonna talk about this controversial article in a minute, not just yet, but, I have been challenging myself when I notice these things show up, even in myself. I think we have a lot of internalized misogyny, maybe internalized sexism that even amongst women that we, we see it happening and we don't call it out. We don't recognize it for what it is. And just even celebrating each other's success in the context of friendship and is something that in some ways is unpacking or deconstructing some of the norms, which is like, we don't necessarily do that, or, you know, let's not be braggadocious, so to speak. So I'm curious, you mentioned, you could tell, uh, before we jump into examples from the book and hopefully have some questions from the chat. So, and I have some scenarios I would love advice on too, but you mentioned that this has shown up for you. So I'm, I'm, I wanna invite you to share a personal story, if you don't mind, I didn't warn you about this, but, in terms of how you applied the framework or what was, you know, I gave us an analogy of being in the boat and feeling like a wave is going to take you out and your passenger. Uh, can you share one story about, uh, about you in your own life about how 
money and love was a conflict and how you worked through it or what, what you wish you would have known, you know, in that situation before it happened? Yeah, I mean, I have, so I will say that having these conversations is like, in some ways, the analogy I use is going to the gym, right? Like we, we start out like with lighter weights, right? And maybe you're sore afterwards, like it's uncomfortable, like to have these conversations. It's not, we're not saying like, oh, just combine these conversations and it'll be all rosy and just follow this framework. It has five steps, it's, they're linear. Like, no, that's that, <laughs> definitely not the impression that I want to leave uh, our viewers with. These are complicated. Um, the framework is laid out in five steps, but it is often iterative and you might think you have clarified something and then you come back and you have to re-clarify. Um, and, and so I've been now having these conversations for over, you know, it's been almost 17 years, 18 years with my now husband. The first time we had this conversation was interesting. It was actually, uh, while we were in Myra's class, we were, we had decided to live together and we were trying to figure out, we were looking for apartments in San Francisco, but we knew that we were doing dramatically different things after we were graduating. We were, my husband was going to work for a hedge fund and I was going to work for a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for an apartment in San Francisco, an expensive city. And so the conversation was like, should we be paying the same amount of rent? What mm -hmm. was fair? Um, we, you know, we had to print out our credit scores and everything to apply for the apartment. So we knew we were transparent with each other for the beginning about, you know, what our financial backgrounds looked like, which is super important. That's like a whole other conversation we could have about, you know, financial transparency with a with a partner. Um, but but we hadn't talked about like what is equitable, and so you know we we had like kind of a bumpy conversation where you know I said like I wouldn't necessarily look for an apartment above this rate given my salary if you want to live in an apartment that is you know bigger has more amenities like we should talk about what seems reasonable and what's fair mm -hmm. and so you know that was and it was it was super uncomfortable like it was our early weightlifting days and so like it was very vulnerable and that's why i think these conversations are so hard jackie it's because mm -hmm. you're revealing what is important to you with someone whose opinion you care a lot about and it might feel counterintuitive like of course you want to reveal what's important to you as someone who, who's opinion you care a lot about but that's the when it feels the most risky right because we don't want to do something that is going to jeopardize a relationship that we're excited about but what we know from the research is that being vulnerable being sharing things intimately with people actually creates more affinity and a more uh, closeness and so it was by pushing through those uncomfortable conversations and getting to a point where we were saying okay you're right it's not actually um, we don't have to, because I, I was also adamant of like, I don't want to be, you know, dependent on a man for, you know, too much of my financial um, health. And we could, we could talk about, um, yeah. about all the implications of that. So, so we did get to a point where we we're paying, we we're contrib contributing different amounts towards our rent. I felt okay about it. He felt okay about it. Um, but that's what started us off on, on this journey of, of having these difficult conversations. And we didn't use the framework at that point because it didn't exist, but we yeah. did have a lot of the same principles of, of sharing what was important to us, having an early conversation before we felt ready and pushing through that discomfort to get to a, a, a place where we both felt like we could live with the results. You know, I absolutely love that example, especially because of this question of between equality and equity. I feel like in their world, that's even a, a topic that and they get conflated. And what I love how you said is what would be equitable, right? Versus what would be equal. And I think this council and I, I actually have been polling different friends in anticipation of this conversation and even young, younger people. And this is a big one that's showing up because people are entering relationships, especially with housing affordability, what it is, a uh, big challenge in general. And the idea of some per, one of the, the people in the relationship, and often it could be even roommates. It doesn't have to be love relationships. And it's something to talk about. And this idea you have to make everything equal, you split a bill, everything's equal, everything's equal, equal, equal. And I'm inviting folks to think about a framework of equitability rather than equal and it's uncomfortable because we're not used to it especially in friendship relationships more so than romantic but let's stick with the romantic example for a minute because more and more people are living together before they get married there's prenups which are somewhat 
normalized. There's post-nups, which are becoming more normalized. So people are understanding and actually contractually entering into love and money, money and love contracts, right, in, in increasing frequency. So what you said, even a, a simple example of what are we going to pay for rent? What can we afford? You can take, I mean, there are a hundred scenarios. Do you buy the nice couch, the shitty couch? Oops, the crappy couch. Do you buy extra pillows? Is that a waste of money? Like, what are you negotiating? And I feel like, at least for me personally, with my husband, and I've been mar married almost 30 years, we the, we got into fights over little stupid stuff that what didn't matter, and I think we were partners on the big pieces, but when you really think about it, every day you're making these mini decisions, uh, especially in that love relationship. What do you buy? Don't. Do you go out for dinner or not? Are you wasting money or you not? So to, to have clarity up front, certainly before you live together, but to sit down and have a framework, your framework, but also that's deeply personal in terms of what you're bringing, you know, your background, your stories, the set of values, maybe again, just to re-mention it, financial trauma. It's like you can, you know what, be physically intimate, emotionally intimate with people, and yet we think that money belongs somewhere else. So I just, uh, just want to put a exclamation mark behind really everything you're saying and how much conflict can be avoided with having conversations even before that event that triggers, you know, something again, that might hi be hijacked by a deep personal history in that context. So let's stay Absolutely. with this example. Sorry, go ahead. I just went off on a little soapbox for a minute. No, I should no. have brought in. I, I, I think you're totally right. And I will say like the first conversation should not be what are we going to pay for rent? Like, hopefully you have an experience of like, I like to say, cause sometimes people, there's this trend towards loud budgeting where people are saying like on the first date, um, I, I need to see your paycheck before I can see whether I'm going to go out with you or not, which is, you know, I think that's a, a bit extreme, but I do think there are more lighthearted ways to bring up money early in your relationship. And I, would say like if you if are thinking of taking a trip together that's a really good time because vacations are the it really does showcase all of these decisions about do we fly like do we fly coach do we fly like there's so many even choices of types of airline seats you could make at this point right of like do you get the you know checked bag do you get early check in like everything is um, a, a choice. And so it's a good time to sit down and have a, like, make it a light conversation, but say like, you know, we haven't traveled before together. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about, about um, our budget for this trip. And to your point, Jackie, bring in some of your, you can say like, when I traveled with my family, we mm -hmm. couldn't afford to, to fly. This was actually true. In my family growing up, we took road trips. Like that was, we went to visit my relatives in the Midwest and we would drive. And, um, and that was, like I love taking road trips to this day because that was that's a, a nostalgic thing from my childhood. There are some people that it sounds torturous to spend hours and hours in a car um, when you could fly somewhere. So I think it's it's finding those places that are less high stakes to have mm -hmm. early conversations in a relationship and build that muscle because it does get easier over time. As I'm sure you with 30 years of marriage, like you're probably not fighting about the couch anymore. Um, it's, there are there are other, it's not to say everything's always smooth sailing, but like you've, you've probably established some um, some guide, guide guardrails or some norms that you agree yeah. on at this point. Yes, well, we don't fight about, fight about coaches, but we do still fight about fluffy pillows. I'm pro fluffy <laughs> pillow. Against. It is literally the thing in our house um, that <laughs> it's like because I keep he can't, I keep sneaking them out back onto the bed, <laughs> sneaking them back in the closet. I'm like, it's a guest room. What do you care? And it's like I care <laughs> that we put these fluffy pillows. And finally, I had to let go and get rid of the fluffy pillows. You know, it's everything is about accommodation. <laughs> I'll just say that. But let's, before we jump on to friendship and start to bring in some other examples, let's stick with the romantic relationships. And you touched on something that I think is so key that I'd love your advice. I'm sure folks listening would love your counsel on is this idea of transparency, right? It's how in your wisdom and your years of doing the course and talking to people, what do you think about at what point you are you disclose 
your, especially if you're headed towards a serious relationship, I would say, your financial state and wellness, especially now when there are extraordinary amounts of student debt out, out there, personal debt. And people might have credit records, you know, that might prevent them from obviously getting a mortgage at some point. And I'm no judgment on this coming from me because there are a million different reasons why folks um, carry debt. Some debt is uh, obviously very positive. It's not that all debt is bad. So thoughts on transparency when it comes to money and love. Uh, I just I'd love your thoughts. Well, it's so important, um, and I, I certainly think that I'm waiting, Jackie, for the Netflix series where a couple goes on a date and discloses their educational debt to each other because it's so <laughs> important to normalize that this is something so many people are grappling with. But you're right; we don't we don't see that reflected in our you know um, streaming series or in any other uh, portrayal, actually. So we feel shamed. And we feel lots of um, like, oh, how could I have let this happen? And and it's and then we're very reluctant to share. So I I think it's really critical to um, to push through that discomfort. I I, I certainly think though that um, you don't have to start with like, let me show you my my debt payment. But you could you could start to kind of disclose it in in small ways and see how that feels, right? So in the same realm of exposure therapy, the way that works in, in, in therapy is like you are exposed to smaller and smaller. Like I have a friend whose son had a peanut allergy, right? And so she would like take him to the um, allergist and he would get like a half a peanut and they would wait for a couple hours and see what happened. And then he would get like a slightly bigger dose. So that's a way to approach this notion of, of transparency. So even in this conversation we were just talking about, about going on a trip together, you could, you could say, to someone, um, you know, I'm excited to take this trip. Um, just to let you know, my budget for this trip is X. I am really committed to making my monthly loan payment for my educational loans. And it's really important to me that I not get behind on those payments. Do you have any payments that you're making? I'm curious, right? So I think by going first, that sets the stage for the other person to feel a little bit more comfortable disclosing what they're carrying debt wise. Um, and you're, you're, again, you're sort of dropping it casually, seeing how that feels, and then getting hopefully some positive feedback from the, the other person you're talking with, that then lets you feel more comfortable disclosing even more. So we're not, I'm certainly not advocating, like, sitting down and, you know, printing, like, handing in your tax return to someone and saying, like, okay, like, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. But, but there are these natural places. Again, I mentioned when my husband and I were looking for our first rental apartment together, like, we had to prepare this packet with all of our credit scores. And he knew that I had taken out loans um, at, to go to business school. And because I was working for a nonprofit, Stanford was actually paying them off as part of their loan repayment program. And so we had a very frank conversation when we were married, when we got married, and Stanford said, actually, that doesn't count anymore, even though I had not changed my employer, uh, my marital status and my tax filing status had changed. And they said, we're no longer paying your loans. And so we then had a transparent conversation at that point wow. saying, okay, well, here's my situation. It's changed. How do we want to handle our debt now, right? It was still my debt, but it was because we were married that they were not repaying it. So let's talk about that. And we decided to pay that off um, based on our shared assets because we didn't want to carry that together. So I think there are these places to expose a little bit. And then and then once you feel comfortable at that point, we had had lots of conversations. It was like, okay, well, there's a lot of money here that I'm going to be still paying. How do we want to address that? Oh, this is such wise counsel. I'm going back in my head now to replay everything I did wrong, by the way, because um, we just didn't talk about it. Again, I've been married for 30 years. I'm not in, in the dating scene, but I do feel pretty strongly that as you head towards, especially moving in together, uh, that I'm more on the transparent front. I Because you... If there are things someone else should know before they commit to what effectively will become a legally binding relationship, whether you're married or not at some point, there is just really an obligation, I feel, to be transparent. And I'll say there's another side of it, too, where, you know, there are folks that might have hidden wealth, right? Like kids who inherited money, who maybe feel 
uncomfortable about that, don't know how to show up with that in, in loving relationships too. And then the parents step in and want to, you know, get that prenup or whatever it is in place. So this is not just a partner to partner, especially on that side when there, there can be a well situation on the side of the other uh, one, one of the partners they need help and guidance navigating it because they don't want it to create an issue and what is love relationship for them. So just thanks. Oh my gosh. So much more to unpack. I feel like you and I should have a podcast together. We can be like the Esther Perel, but only talking about (laughs) putting. I love it. I'm in. Right. I know. I will say like, please don't feel bad because I also, I did not encounter this advice you know, early enough in my life to not make a ton of mistakes too. So the last thing I would want to leave anyone with is this feeling of like, oh, I really should have done things differently. If anything, I think it's like, no matter when you encounter this idea of having these types of conversations using this framework, it's not too late. I want this to be like a hopeful, um, a hopeful thing for people. And in fact, we've gotten this feedback, which I love from um, a reader that shared with us I have been beating myself up about my second marriage failing. And once I read your book and looked at the framework, I realized there was nothing I could have done differently. I did all the right things. And this helped me realize that it wasn't my fault and it wasn't actually something that I could have done. So I I hope that even if there was a decision that happened in the past, that the framework might give you a sense of peace and the sense of like most decisions are can actually be changed. I think the the one decision that it's very hard to undo is having a baby, right? Like you, once that baby's in the world, like you can't take it back. But most everything else, like you can revisit. And I I want people to feel empowered. That's really a goal and not a, oh shoot, I totally did something wrong. Oh, you, well, and again, I, Yes. And I, that's the counsel we give about anything money that the place to start, because we all have done, made mistakes. I bought that, you know, Versace, well, no, <laughs> Versace, but whatever. I brought that sweater that I thought was a great investment, you know, and that it stayed in my closet and the bigger ones, actually, I'm unwinding a transaction today that was just dumb. And it was a lot of money and it ended up being a lot of time and a lot of headache. And I have been beating myself up for it for years. And I'm finally closing it out, taking the loss. And I can't tell you what I'm replaying in my head right now. Like you knew better. What were you thinking? We were cavalier. So I think this idea, and again, I reflect back to the money course in part that we all have stuff in our lives, period, certainly in relationships and also this intersection of money and love that we can't do redo. We just got to be where we are, learn, build. I love that because I'm a bodybuilder, build the muscle, have the tools, practice in the gym so that we're strong enough uh, to make these decisions. So just a heck yes on that one. So we're getting some questions uh, in the chat. So I'm going to move on from love relationships to family so complicated, so so complicated. And one that came up in the chat that I I wanna address because I think we all have someone or we might be that someone in a family relationship where they don't necessarily have good financial habits. And again, trauma of money, their behaviors, one in particular, overspending, just getting yourself in a perhaps in a debt situation, not because not the good debt. There are lots of good debt. Let's just say the less than good debt, lifestyle driven debt. And you have another family member. Maybe that person has not gone all on those trips, bought the expensive and has a nice nest egg of savings or has a big job, whatever that situation might be. Siblings is a big one for this, but it doesn't have to be. It can be within family where the responsible one, and again, bad things happen that are not people's fault, where they need financial assistance, but that's not what we're talking about right this second. We're talking about someone, unhappy family member, unhealthy financial, got themselves in trouble, maybe another sibling, cousin, whatever, that has done all the right things to take care of themselves, and now you, that person needs help. you sacrificed Talk a little bit about those types of dynamics. Um, And again, I think you apply the framework to that scenario, but I'm sure that's not an uncommon scenario that you've you've heard about or had questions about before. No, it's not uncommon. And I think there are all sorts of 
um, tricky situations that we get into with with um, chosen family and with uh, family of origin. And, you know, I am a big fan of third party experts. I have to say that when you're in a, you know, one on one relationship or even in a family dynamic, it is so hard to not get into the grooves of, you know, the knee jerk reactions or the roles that we're used to playing or all of those things. And so whether it's a financial advisor or a therapist or a financial therapist, because mm -hmm. there's a whole burgeoning field of that, um, which I love. It's, I think it's a perfect place to say, mm -hmm. you know, I realize I'm not the most objective person in this situation. And it's going to be really tricky to navigate this. And I don't want it to affect our relationship negatively. Let's lean on an external third party. So if you happen to have a financial advisor, that's a place where you could bring them in. You might say, I, I will, I will talk about this with you under the condition that we bring in a neutral third party who has more expertise and can help us navigate this. I think the trickiest situations I've seen is when two people, um, one well-meaning, you know, one, you know, but and has some resources, the other one who has a need, there's a lot of love there. You know, there's so, someone lends someone else money, there's no contract, there's no terms, there's nothing. And then it's, it's a, a recipe for resentment and for um, just kind of um, building on some of the, the negative emotions that could come up. So I would say in this situation, I would absolutely see if I could bring in, you know, there might be a, a financial therapist that actually makes sense to say, like, let's let's talk about this under the condition that we bring someone with expertise in to help us navigate this conversation. And my co-author, Myra, tells um, this story of when her second husband was um, towards the end of his life, he needed a lot of care, which she was at that point managing at home. His children, he had three children from a previous merit, from previous um, relationships, did not want her to, um, to uh, find a facility for him. They thought that he should be able to stay at home. And it was, it was literally um, physically damaging for her. She was falling. She had, you know, all because she wasn't able to sleep with this 24 or seven caregivers there. So she brought his therapist in to navigate that conversation for her to be able to share what she wanted for the, his children to be able to share what they wanted and ultimately to help to navigate a very tricky situation. And I think that, you know, I, I think about that example because it's something that is she had clarified, though, from the beginning, this is where we come back to the framework, that it was extremely important to her to maintain a positive relationship with her stepchildren. And so when you, you know, in the scenario that you're mentioning, Jackie, if you clarify to yourself, what's most important to me is to main, you know, whatever it is to maintain a positive relationship with this relative or to um, not deplete the resources that I've worked so hard to amass, like you can get real clear and that can give you a, a compass to navigate the situation in a way that if you just sort of respond emotionally, it's going to be really hard to have that clarity. Yeah, thank you. And I agree, having outside help and I question it again, <laughs> Bring so much back to trauma of money because they're trying to train financial advisors in therapy because a lot of folks go, do go to their financial advisors and say help. But last time I checked, a financial advisor in general learns about stocks and bonds and private equity and this and that and every other thing, estate planning, but they don't learn this. This is a new I know. must yes. for a lot of folks. I'm on, I'll get, you know, where's my tide box on this one? I'm going to get back on it. And I don't pretend to be... Esther Perel, right? I don't pretend. I, I, I think that there is a lot of uh, therapy trained professionals that have those skill sets that need the financial lens. And again, that's why this uh, is uh, the course I was talking about, I think is so important. But this is new. Right? This is very new. And, and financial, as you said, financial therapists, uh, ones trained in money speak and also in therapy protocols and conflict resolution, everything, we're actually at Chimani searching for those folks and want to meet them and, and figure out how to highlight them because I think there's a shortage of folks. I don't even know. I think there is maybe a training. We're starting to look into that as sort of more of a you know certification. But getting outside help, especially in family situations, and but it also costs money, right? Like that's the tricky thing. 
that that kind of advice is hard to find that's good and also can be very expensive. That being said, yes to recognizing, even slowing down and saying, this is a source of conflict, uh, either if it's in a care situation or as often happens, I mean, that's a whole nother ball of wax when people have their surprises and wills or a sense of entitlement around resources, especially in their second marriages, through you know, different groups of kids, all of that. I've seen that absolutely destroy family relationships in time. Even. And to your point, that's why if you can have some of those conversations and go there when it's not around a death, not around a, a medical event, not around a divorce, not around that, because at that point, oof, you know, there's a lot of emotion um, showing up. So I want to, I'm just recognizing the time and we have oh, so many questions, but <laughs> so much to talk about. Can we just do this like once a week? Um, I have a couch. I don't know if you see that with fluffy pillows, by the way. <laughs> they are behind me. I will me. never I ask you to put away this. the fluffy pillows, Jackie. Thank you. I love you. Uh, but around this article, and in some ways, you, we both got it sent to us by, because we're money folks, money women, by uh, a huge number. My daughter is the one that pulled it up to me, and we're going to post it in the chat. And in some ways, I don't want to give airtime to what in many people in the comment section said, is this a joke? Like, are we in the 1950s? And But on the flip side of it, I think we both read the piece. And again, we can't completely summarize it, but I'm going to give the title of the piece. It's called, so it appeared in the cut. And the title is, oh, it was, yeah, yeah sorry, it's cut out from my article. A Case for Marrying an Older Man. And I did post about it on LinkedIn. I'm not sure you have yet, uh, but it is an article. We'll post it in the chat. And it is basically by a, by a younger woman who's, who's saying that women's lives are hard. You have children. You have to pay. And if you can, uh, she's making the case that if you can marry an older wealth guy, <laughs> guy it's, uh, that's a good option, right? You get to go on vacations. You don't have to pay for and have a nice lifestyle and yeah, you might have to listen to a lot of stories that you might not otherwise want to listen to and maybe subjugate your opinion on things, but that's okay because he's your teacher. And I'm, I'm sounding a little more harsh than I meant to be, um, but maybe not. And yet there are some great points in the article that we talked about, about the reality of modern lives and living together. But this idea that a man is a financial plan has been around as long as I've known. In fact, I'm pointing back here to Gloria Steinem. I was just at her 90th birthday party a week ago in New York, who is, of course, an icon of the feminist movement uh, that's talking about women's financial wellness and agency and the, the ability to have a choice. So that's a long setup to a long article, but I know you read it. And for those that haven't read it, Let's talk about this idea a little bit that was put forth that, that a man is a financial plan and and feel free to comment further because you've read it on some of the, the points in the article that deeply resonated with you on the positive or on the negative side. Yeah, well, I, I you know, Myra sent it to me and I, I think, you know, she is also, as you know, an OG feminist um, and was a pioneer first female faculty member hired to teach at Stanford Business School, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we both had some strong opinions about it. I mean, look, it was obviously written to be controversial and to, um, you know, but I, but I think it's a trend, right? I think this idea of the stay at home girlfriend on TikTok and the videos of like, here's how I make my smoothie and here's how I do yoga while my, you know, boyfriend is off like making our money. That's, that's, this is not, you know, a unique um, phenomenon. I do think what the article is recognizing is that um, the choices available to women are are not easy ones, right? And so, no matter how much progress we have made in you know in the workforce, there's still a pay gap. Um, no matter how much progress we've made with all sorts of fertility technology, there's still a very narrow window when women are you know able to have children, and that frankly coincides with the years that we're advancing in the workplace. And and so I what I, you know, if you can get past like all the controversial parts of, you know, it's so great to be whisked away to France and, you know, live with my older 
husband who pays for everything and we have a cleaner three times a week. Um, like, yeah, but I mean, that if you can get past that, I think she makes some points at the end of, I mean, I love this quote, overlay the years a woman is supposed to establish herself in her career and her fertility window, and it's a perfect, miserable circle. And, you know, she talks about how um, some things are not not feasible in our current structure. She mm -hmm. certainly has one perspective on, on what to do in that structure. I have a different perspective, and that's the reason that the last chapter of our book is all about pushing against those structures that make this time so challenging for women and frankly for men, um, because it's not enough for us to solve our own money and love problems individually, because that perpetuates all of the societal uh, norms and the conditions, the policies within our companies that make it really challenging to um, to have a personal life of, at, of any kind outside of our working systems, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, you know, my, I'm choosing to see, um, you know, uh, yes, a man should not be a financial plan, but let's talk more about the structures that make this the case. And let's actually do something about those structures. Um, let's take a page from Gloria Stein and let's take a page from my co-author, Myra Strober, and shine a light on this the terrible, uh, inequitable structures. Like our money systems are systems of, of business, of work, are really not so good on the love front. And it will take collective action for us to push against those systems and change policies and make it so that there is more paid parental leave and make it so that childcare doesn't bankrupt everyone um, and make it so that elder care is a, a more supported thing because we have reached peak, peak 65 and more people are turning 65. I think it's 11,000 per day than ever before. And even if you don't have children, you are going to have to deal with elder care, either for a relative or certainly eventually for yourself. Um, and if you are lucky to live a long life, which we all are, by the way, um, the, the trends towards longevity is are, are definitely clear as well. So we are living longer and we need to be more intentional. So that's my my take on the article is really to look past the individual pieces of it, um, because there are so many reasons that our society doesn't have the money and love conversations together. But once we are aware of all those structures, we then are more empowered to do something about them. I mean, so well said. And again, we can make an, a long session on that article. What I would add about in a complete agreement, there is some good stuff in there. And I think on the flip side, it's perpetuating this idea that a man is only valuable if he is the financial plan right, which is limiting in choices and not an economic reality for a lot of folks. And I think uh, a force, you know, behind this idea that the economy is not working for me as a man, you know, where I'm told that my value is wrapped up in my checkbook. And what does that breed, right, in terms of insecurities or discomfort or just expectations of failure. Uh, so it's not, yes, on one side that the idea that you're sexy in your 20s and you got to use it to lock up, you know, this person who's going to take care of you and oppositely is so it's not, it's a feminist view, meaning feminist is is caring about how everyone thrives in this this scenario. So thank you for, for pulling that up. And, you know, on the systems place, agree like we're having a lot of conversations with companies and this is we're doing this in financial capabilities month financial wellness month because increasingly and i know you know this is a trend too that companies are saying we need to do more to help our employees do uh, around their financial wellness and it can be ha helping with debt which is crippling i just learned about a company yesterday that is helping people navigate student debt in a very thoughtful way. Another company, it was this fund that's doing investments around economic mobility and, and supporting folks of lower incomes, the companies that can provide interest-free loans, uh, applications that allow you to not have to wait two weeks to get a paycheck. So companies are really saying, we need to do more to help build, to your point, let's think about it as a muscle, I like to think about it as a muscle too, these financial capabilities that are beyond budgeting and saving and are more interpersonal because a lot of us we're seeing a lot of the conflict and why people can't show up as 
you know, as healthy full self. And I would argue mental health is very deeply connected with this too, because we know the impact of financial stress, that this is big. This is just not a nice to have conversation. This is a must have conversation uh, around this topic. Well, okay, I can't believe it's we got five minutes to close out. And Abby, just, I'd love to give you a few minutes. So you wrote this gorgeous book, which I'm going to I mean, it's just going to go on. I buy it at your local bookstore, by the way, if you can. But also, <laughs> I don't know do you, if you have a favorite location to buy the book. But buy the book. And it is going to be the best investment um, you could make in your financial future. I'm just saying that because um, I, I think it is. But share a little bit about where the book has led you in terms of the courses. You have one starting on April 26th. But this is not a one and done for you. You're building this into a movement like we are, which is why I wanted to have you on, on together today. So tell us uh, what's next for you and the Money and Love Institute. Uh, well, Jackie, thank you so much just for being such an amazing advocate of the book and for everyone getting their financial lives in order. It's so important. Um, so I totally agree with you that our um, we, we need more people uh, combining these conversations and pushing our um, financial advisors and others to talk more about love and be more informed and educated. So I started the Money and Love Institute to help people make better decisions that lead to happiness, prosperity, and purpose. And over since the book has been out, it's been out about a year, um, I've got lots of questions from folks saying, you know, it's great to have a book. It's really, you know, it's a helpful framework. I just, it's hard to make the time to go through it. It's a little bit daunting to do this alone. Like how, how it sounds so great that there was a course once about this, you know, how, how can I take that again? And it's, we were talking before we started about, it's not being taught at Stanford right now. And so the Money and Love Institute is offering a version of this course through a platform called Maven that does live cohort based learning. And so, as you mentioned, it's starting later this month. I actually have a free webinar coming up uh, next Friday, April 12th at 9 a.m. Pacific to give folks a sneak peek on um, how to make big life decisions you won't regret. So this is a way to kind of get a taste of what's in the course. It's going to be um, talking through the framework for folks who are at a crossroads, uh, maybe thinking about making a big career change as lots of people are right now, or you know, moving in with a partner, or maybe ending a relationship, or, or moving, since now we could potentially live anywhere um, if you're a remote employee. So um, walking through the framework in a structured way with lots of exercises that are not in the book. So there's some some new things I've been cooking up um, and doing it in a in an amazing community of lots of other folks who want to engage. And what I know so much about decision making, Jackie, you can probably attest to this, is that when you are the one facing a decision, it's almost like we have blinders on and we don't see the choices available to us. And, and one of the, the C's, uh, the choices, is about expanding your consideration set. And so by being in this course with other community members, um, you might get some creative ideas that wouldn't have occurred to you as you're kind of standing dealing with your decision all alone. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, and I, I think that your team put the link in the chat. So um, hopefully there will be some folks who hear about it and get excited. Yes, and we'll do a follow-up post that summarizes all of the things we put in the in the chat as well. Well, I just want to thank you for joining, Abby. Uh, just to summarize, uh, again, if you're not, uh, pull stuff from the chat, yes. We'll also post about it, yes, for those that are watching, perhaps after the recording. If you joined us live, thank you. We've got four, three more, three more of these coming every Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we're Money Plus Kids, the following money plus divorce with a, with an expert, a lawyer, and someone who created a, a whole platform around uh, making divorce more navigable and affordable. And then our last one, as we mentioned, talk about babies, uh, a finance, well, money plus fertility with uh, Robin Hauser, who's a filmmaker who's working on a feature length documentary on this topic. And her film's called Thaw. So sign up for the newsletter. We obviously, um, continue to post comments, jump back over to regular LinkedIn as a follow up too, because we did write about, I love the article we wrote about you a year ago uh, about the book when the book came out. But this is what we're about at She Money. We want to make, we want to make you comfortable. We want to help, you know, give the muscle, the tools, the navigation system to help really help around 
uh, women, uh, not just women, but but money, money scenarios. And last thing, this just in, and Abby, stay with me. Oh, I pinged for one more minute. Tomorrow, we are going to be announcing the She Money Summit. Uh, this is big. It's a big event in Salt Lake City on June 6th and 7th. So stay tuned for that. I, um, it's more conversations like this with experts in the field. And our goal is really to help and support you on your journey to full financial agency and wellness. So thank you, Abby, for joining. Look at this. I Just 12 o'clock on, on the dot, my time. Thank you. And I'll see you next Friday, Abby, because I am absolutely going to sign up for that webinar as well. We can always learn more when it comes to this topic. So thanks again for joining live. And thank you, Abby, for joining us with the LinkedIn Live with She Money today. Happy Financial Capabilities Month. Thank you so much, Jackie. This was a delight. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.